feel quite comfortable in the understanding now that culture and religion are very different. That in Islam particularly, these things have become so enmeshed that I don't know where things originate from. Like, for example, Amru talks about in their book this notion of, or maybe it's not in their book, maybe it was just in the podcast, but like how um, the story of, I think it's Lut or Lot in English, um, but like the one where like, and again, I'm super paraphrasing here. Like, no, no, go. But I'm no scholar, so I'm going to excuse myself from that. <laughs> but like basically um, a prophet who went to the city, saw that people were sinning. God was like, okay, take your people, leave the city, don't look back. But wife looked back and she got turned into a pillar of salt but like the main thing about it was like why were the people sinning and then I think where this came out is like this is where like the whole you know no gay people comes from uh, apparently which is that the people were sinning because it was men sleeping with men but also if there there are other interpretations that Amru was mentioning about actually no it's not about it's that there were people non-consensually having sex with each other they were raping each other and actually, that's the origin of the sin there. And that's why that whole city was condemned. And so there's a whole heap of research that I would have to do in order to unpick those things. And the thing is, it's hard, right? Because like time is limited. I don't think that it's my vocation to go and become a Muslim scholar and to go and find these things out. I think there are women and there are people for whom that is their vocation. But like, I need to start figuring out what it is that I need to do difference between as a basis I think that means going and reading the Quran and as a basis for that that means going and learning Arabic and that will mm. be a heck of a lot of research into these things and that's a long process and I look at that sometimes and sometimes I don't feel ready for it because there's also this element which again that wonderful Imam Imam had said to me which was that like for example in Islam you have a really direct relationship with Allah you don't have a priest or an interlocutor to like you confession or to tell you what to do to seek forgiveness that's just between you and god and so it's the same with your relationship with the quran like you can't have someone you can have people like teach it to you but that's very different from like them teaching you what the letters mean and what the words mean and like what the general historical context of it. you going and finding what that meaning means for yourself is really really different Hello everyone, I am your host Raya and welcome to Chai with Raya, a weekly podcast on which I bring on a guest from the food, fitness or entertainment industry and we discuss all things life and culture through some banter, deep meaningful conversation and of course gameplay. So if you haven't done so, make sure to subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. If you love this podcast and are listening to this on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Audible or wherever you stream your podcasts from, if you could do me a kind favour and make sure to rate the podcast on whichever platform Form you're listening it on because it organically grows the show connects us with listeners who haven't tuned in before and puts the podcast in top spaces for all the streaming sites as well feel free and i encourage you to tag us whilst you listen to this on the tiktoks the twitters the flitters the grams and the pinterest it's back y'all i'm just saying and as i always say overall just share the love now get your cuppers ready and please welcome poet writer and author amani said how are you, friend? I'm good, friend. I got my chai. I'm with I got, I got my chai as well. Hello, hello, hello. But before we do anything, before I do anything, this is your warm-up game, aka known as the five-second rule. The five-second rule is basically where you have five seconds to list three things. I'm going to say, like, let's say, for example, if I was to be like, name three colors in five seconds. Go. You have five seconds to do that. All right? <laughs> No. Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. So this is your first, first five second rule questions. Name three things you say to yourself after doing a number two. Go. What? <laughs> <laughs> right, what the fuck? <laughs> That's the first one. <laughs> These are creative questions. I'm creative? Not yes. <laughs> talking about tatty right now. You don't <laughs> say anything in your head after you've just done a tatty? I don't generally talk to myself after taking a tatty, no. Well, now you need to. What would I say? What would you say? Oh, that was a good one. I don't know. What do brown people usually say? It's something about, like, how your bowel movements, right? Like. Yeah. Was it a solid or a liquid? You know what I mean? Dude. Do you send pictures, by the way, when you're on the toilet? I do. Sometimes. No, I don't send pictures. I'm definitely guilty of, like, using my phone on the toilet. But, like, sending pictures, people can tell. 
Uh, I do. I send it to my really, once we get like really, really like this, I send it because I think it's funny. So why not? All right. Next question. <laughs> Stop judging me. This is a non-judgment zone. Next question. List three other names beginning with A other than Amani. Go. Aiden, Amina, Aubrey? Aubrey? That's a name. Where did Aubrey come from? Who's she? Uh, she's, uh, she's a singer somewhere. All right. Your question number three. In Nothing Concrete, your podcast um, with the Barbican, you and Glamour would discuss being fetishized by the West. By the way, paraphrasing this, you guys discuss privilege, you guys discuss being light skin, about being labeled as um, exotic, such as Vietnamese Mexican. Flipping the narrative, okay, list three positive things about being fetishized. Go. This is a trick question. People think you're sexy. You are different from the normal crowd. This is a bullshit question. Next. <laughs> 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 wow! <laughs> All right. To being fetishized. Next question. Anyway, there, ha there always is positive, like getting laid. When you just need to get laid, you get laid. You use what you got. Do you know what I mean? How can you be turned on when you know that the only reason that person's with you is for like because you're a Muslim or because you're a certain thing? Ew. I think you just do it. It's like you don't think about it. It's like you're using me to get something, and I'm using you to get something. We have very different views of like how we take our lovers, but go on. <laughs> That was just a one night stand. I'm not talking about like in general, like falling in love with somebody. I'm just talking about one night stand. Um, all right. Do it. Sorry, we're going so deep on like your five second questions. Go on, go on, go on. I know. <laughs> no worries. Question number four. List three things about publishing your book split you wish you knew then, but no one told you about. Go. You need someone other than yourself to edit a book. Um, getting a cover takes a really long time. Uh, ah, was that the end of the time? That was five seconds. It's a five second roll. <sighs> These, okay, go on, go on. <laughs> Last question. Brace yourself. You're very politically, should I say, um, vocal? Sh should mm -hmm. I say that? Sure. Yeah. And knowledgeable and eloquent in a lot of your speech, your work. So if you were to run as a PM, list three things you would run your prime ministry presidency on go anti-racism gender equity and kindness uh, okay go on finish it <laughs> that was three no you did anti-racism gender equity and kindness and yeah. you said three things on my manifesto right oh I, I didn't hear kindness that was a thing oh Got kindness, it. Yeah, kindness was important well uh, i would be intrigued to know who votes for you for kindness man <laughs> I mean, not any of the racist British people that voted for the Tories, but hey! Hey, we digressed. Do you like your... I've had some creatives here who have a regular 9 to 5 during the day, and then there are the dancers or actors and things like that. Do you enjoy doing your regular 9 to 5, or do you also yearn for the day, just like sometimes I used to when I had a 9 to 5, where you can just do what you love to do? I'm lucky in that I don't have that problem. I really do like my five. And the thing is, I quite like that I have that and I have my writing practice as quite separate things. Just because, and like I've had this conversation with so many other freelancers where if you're just doing that, sometimes you have to take on work that's not necessarily like what you love, but you take mm. it on because you have skills. And like with this, what's also nice about it is that like I'm learning things that my writing in my writing I'm learning things that feed into my consultancy work and it all just feels very balanced and also I make the money I need <laughs> is there um before we start anything I was intrigued to know in all of my research mm -hmm. of you the thousands thousands of tabs mm -hmm. and the podcast um there is no mention of the fact why your Instagram handle is, or just you're known some places as Amani the Poet, as opposed to Amani Saeed. So I just wanted to understand where Amani the Poet comes from, because I've also seen some of the spoken word artists and poets that do that. Yeah, I mean, honestly, the only reason it's that is because I think Amani Saeed was taken, and before my handle used to be Amani Exchange 19. <laughs> <laughs> is that the Bebo days, the high five days? Do you know? Do you know? And like, it, that, it was like that for like a good 
three years, I think, or however long I've been on Instagram. Yeah. And like, I think a friend just said it to me. They were like, why don't you just do something like Amani the Poet? And obviously they must have heard of George the Poet and just ripped him off because he <laughs> OG version of that. But like, that's not even accurate now. And I've been thinking of changing it so much because now we've done Queer Party Bar. Not just poetry. Yes, which brings me to my number one diving questions, which I love to ask poets and spoken word artists and writers in general. As somebody who has, who's a fan of like, Pashto poetry or like Urdu poetry and then kind of like for the last couple of years has been diving into like facilitation and like poetry and spoken word. I am very grey in my understanding of the difference between poetry and spoken word. Do you think you've got a grass roots on it and would you be able to explain that? Oh my god. I mean, I feel like every poet spoken word and air quotes are not that you speak to will have a different answer to this but like we used to talk about this a lot when I was at Barbican Young Poets and like honestly the only meaningful distinction I've been able to make between is how they're meant to be consumed and like page poetry being that like you know obviously you will read page poetry though like the whole point of point, point blank is that there's a musicality to it possibly that only comes out when it's read and like that's the origin of it right it's an oral form but it's it's really hard to make the distinction like the thing about any medium is that there are so limited rules I guess the only yeah truly the only distinction that people are making recently because like, poetry has always been or will continue to be it's just like this modern distinction between what we see on stage mm -hmm. and then what we see on the page and maybe there are things about that that like come out better in some ways than others I think everything's possible in either form, but for example, like maybe it's easier to spot a Sestina if it's, you know, written, although that's not true, because like <laughs> you can all that out orally. Honestly, like I, I personally think there's no distinction. I think people use it as a lazy distinction between like spoken word on the stage being performed at a night, which again, you could just get up and read from your book and that technically is spoken word versus something that is like intentionally written to be read. But there are no, no, go ahead, please. No, there are no rules. That was it. <laughs> Where would you place yourself today after especially having written the short film that is Queer Very Bar? Like, where would you place yourself today? Just a writer overall, would you say? Or would you still hybrid yourself between all of those things? I'm not sure. I'm really not. And it's a question I've been asking myself a lot these days. Like, for instance, with Queer Very Bar, the reason she asked me to come along and co-write was specifically because they wanted me to put poetry and poem elements film and like I think because poetry is where I started no matter what or medium I moved to I think that element will always be there and I like that because like to me anyway what poetry means so many different things to different people is being able to capture the essences of things and if I can do and like in a, in a nice way <laughs> really loose terms here but I mean as long as I can kind of do that in whatever form I'm in I'm very comfortable with any of these terms to be honest I don't I don't feel a particular affinity to any of them. one of them's in my handle <laughs> <laughs> well let's talk about I was researching some of the projects that you did and I wanted to list these projects and ask you what has been one of the challenges of working on this project that can be internally or externally and what has been a highlight a celebration of these projects so I'm just going to name these projects and you can go one by one and then if you get lost, just let me know and I'll bring it back. So I was really fascinated by Pick and Mix that you did with Rich Mix. Mm -hmm. Jesus at the Nightclub, how you described it. By the way, I love this article that, what was it? The, oh my God, where is it? There's so many articles. Is it Arts UK or something Arab? Shift was my favorite article on you. I will say that. I think the depth that they went to and then something Arab, they did something on you, which just describes your work very, very well. So I would just say they describe Split very, very interestingly. But anyway, back to my question, discussing the project. Pick and Mix by Rich Mix, Jesus at the Nightclub for Arts UK, Barbican Young Poet, Split, The Henna Party, and Universe, which I didn't know that you knew Afsha, because I also know Afsha. And Afsha was there the other day. Did you meet Afsha? I did. Yeah, I know Afsha really well. But um, okay, that's a lot of projects. So, <laughs> so just one quick thing, challenging and highlights or, right. yeah. Pick and mix challenge 
it was smack in the middle of the pandemic and we were trying to facilitate poetry workshops with students that were quite young. They were like between eight and 11 years old and being able to do that in like a thousand different ways. Mr. G and I are the ones who ran that yeah. research mix. And like, and along with Max, who was a filmmaker, but we were the poetry facilitators. And like, from having to be on Google Classroom to like capture these young learners' attention uh, on Google Classroom and having to think and innovate about ways to do that when we couldn't actually physically go to schools. We recorded um, some videos with Rich Mix where we were poetry professors and just literally did some live poetry workshops that they could watch. And then when things opened up and we could go into the schools, they'd be like, you're famous, we've seen you on YouTube. <laughs> Which actually was the best thing ever. And I suppose the highlight of that was, oh, just the cool opportunity for the project for these students. Because the whole premise of that project was that it, these, these students would go, we'd run some poetry workshops with them. They'd turn those into poems and ideas <laughs> and sort of what the writing that would be. It was just in the literacy the element um but yeah and, like, and so like they would go there and they would work with a filmmaker max and they would turn those into literal films that they were then screened at rich mix and they would just get oh, to wow. go and what they'd made on these big screens and that nice. can you imagine being that age and being able to do that mm, that is genius it's cool and rich mix came up with a gem in that project yeah. This was in the main auditorium section where you go straight in and to the right. Is that where they were showcased or? Uh, I think it was, I couldn't actually make it on the day because I was working at my previous job where it was a bit more difficult to get out. But um, it was in the cinema, I believe. Uh, like in the actual cinema proper. Jesus at the nightclub, which I think is the most, correct me if I'm wrong in saying this one, but I thought it was such a hilarious title. And the way you described the painting in that article, I think it's like so humorous. Did you get flack for it, by the way? No, I got no flack. Oh, um, okay. And like, cause the thing was, and then ugh, it's just wild. Again, I've lived many lives, and I used to live with a bunch of evangelical Christians at uni. Oh, um, yeah. And so Jesus was on my mind a lot, you know, hey, like. Sus. You believe in Isa Salam anyway, but like there, yeah. I was taken to like events with free dinners, which of course I went to because I was a university student. And of course, being the only brown person there, I get hit up by the pastor all the time. Like, oh, what faith do you belong to? <laughs> oh, you're a Muslim. I hear the Muslim God is a very selfish God. Like, well, no. But it was a really wild time. And uh, at the same time, I was also studying art history. And so these are experiences I've had that were quite formative in the making of that piece. But um, for those who are listening who don't know, Art UK puts out this competition, or it used to every year, um, for the Poetry Day, where people would submit like a poem that they had done based off of a painting in one of their archives. And I can't remember even the title of the poem now. I think it was of um, Jesus about to be disrobed and put up on the cross. But like it's yeah. there, and like for whatever reason, just because of the colors, the composition, all of that. The first time I looked at it, I was like, "Is that Jesus at the club?" The club, the club. Truly, and I guess like if we're talking about challenges, I didn't know what right I had to write about something like that. Mm -hmm. Initially, particularly kind of being surrounded with the people that I was and understanding what Jesus meant outside of this and what he meant to Christians. But like also, I think the opportunity and the amazingness of that was to almost connect with those stories in a way that I hadn't before and like understand this prophet from a very different point of view and to be able to have fun with that which is again like not something that I think we do ordinarily when we think of religion we don't think of fun we don't think of playfulness but actually an imam that I had who passed away unfortunately he used to say that he loved the idea of joyful Islam like, is this the Massachusetts uh, imam that you had? New Jersey. His name New was Jersey. Abdul Saheb, and he was the chaplain at Princeton University. But he used to talk a lot about joyful Islam, what it could be if we came to it with that, well, sorry to keep saying it, but just joy and approaching it from that point of view rather than seeing it as some laborious task that we had to fulfill. And so, yeah, that's, that's how that came about. <laughs> um, Barbican Young Poets alum is next. Okay. 
Um, challenges. It was just hard. We went. It was every other week on a Wednesday. You trot along to the barbecue, and I would go after work. Um, and I, again, I don't know how I used to do all of this pre-pandemic, going into work nine to five, and then trudging off to like poetry seminars with more deep thinking for like two, three hours in the evening. But I think that was the hardest part. Just like yeah. the, that, it took to actually be there to be putting the deep thought that is required of being in the spaces in and like being able to make the most of this opportunity, which is a rare one. And um, how long was it? <clears throat> it's like a, I don't want to say a year long program, but it runs from the autumn into the spring and like it's every other, right. it's a lot. I think it's like over 12 weeks, but um, yeah. And then in terms of what came out, wow, that's my community now. The people that get there, we've still got our little WhatsApp group chat that a little at all these are the people that have become my family these are the people that have become what do we call it we call each other like our guild or our board and uh, i don't know anything about how much we should charge or whether someone's taking the piss with us or just anything at all from like it's to life advice we've got each other and it's the best thing that could have ever happened to me split is next the book oh challenge Writing that when I was so young and still didn't really know shit. I mean, I still don't know shit, but I really didn't know shit then. That was at 25, you wrote? What, remind me again. I was 22. 22. Hey. Yeah. And the thing is, like, what was wild about that was just I <laughs> about the process. It was with a small indie publisher who were absolutely wonderful, Burning Eye. But because they're small, like there's no editors or anything necessarily. They're just people who kind of help you with the proofing and the copy sort of grammatical stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and so there was a lot of this that I didn't realize that I had to figure out on my own. And so like, for example, I went on an Arvon retreat and I was really lucky. Apples and snakes wanted me to go. I was like halfway through writing the book at that point. Had some really, really amazing workshops with Caroline Bird and Roger Robinson. Um, right. And then literally went and rewrote Hoffman based on what I'd learned that weekend. So yeah, that was a grueling process. But like, what the main thing about that was just seeing my writing in print. And like, to be honest, still today, I don't think I've deep town major that was. Like, I'd still look at it and kind of like, oh yeah, I wrote a book a while ago. And it's like, damn, no, you wrote a book. You did. <laughs> um, you can purchase now that on Amazon or via the Burning uh, Books website. Yeah, or via but on their assholes they i get nothing from when things are okay. don't get it on amazon yeah directly from me just dm me or get them from burning eye directly there you go the next is henna pate hey so i don't know why i'm going challenges first i think this is because you told me that but um, <laughs> anyway challenges first this is a self-imposed challenge and it's my fault entirely but running it on my own Mm. Um, challenge of it so I'm the MC I'm the curator I produce it whatever all the terms are and it's a lot and also there's some real limitations to that as well right because and again I've been going through a whole process of thinking about what I would like the henna party to be what I'd like it to mean what its ethos is like what it should stand for who it should be for and like I keep rethinking it and now I think I'm at a place where I understand it but also just I'm one person and even if I wanted it to be for, say, like, queer South Asians, I only represent a very one individual part of that. And yeah. there were things that I will miss. And someone's going to cancel my ass someday. And I'm going to deserve it. Because Damn. You know, right people at the right time. So I think that's the challenge. But, again, the amazingness has been seeing how many of us there are. Mm. You know, like, how many of us there are. How all of us come into a space. How people had all they needed was just the space to come and like be vulnerable and share in. And like, I, I, I'm so proud of that. I'm so, so, so proud of that. And that stemmed from Golden Tongue, which was a night I used to run with the Universe Collective a while ago. Um, but just sort of creating that space, having that space be there, watching people interact, watching people go on to create things that maybe they wouldn't have if they hadn't seen someone else do it, or if they just hadn't been in a space where they felt that they could try thing and then like get that validation that they need and go on to do more and more that's the best that's come out of it and lastly the universe collective uh, so challenges i think 
I think I'm starting to understand how collectives are formed. And mm. I think it has to be a really organic process. And like, I think at the beginning it was, but then it got to the point where it was like, maybe we didn't all agree on what we stood for. We were just kind of like, there are so few brown women, which is what the group was named at, South Asian women, that we can see. We've just picked the ones that we can find. We're going to try and figure something out. Great, sisterhood. But also we fundamentally disagree with some things. And like, it just didn't end up working out in the end. And like, that's okay, because it was a good learning experience for all of us. We all grew in really different ways from that. We all took different things from that. And like, I definitely gained beautiful friends because of that. Um, but it was just, it was like a tough lesson in how to and how not to do collectives. Mm. But again, I suppose the opportunity, again, just meeting those people, learning how not to do things as well as how to do them. And kind of the really beautiful moments that we did have, even in sometimes where there were disagreements. We had a couple of retreats together where we were just running Ooh. against each other, for each other. And those are, those are highlights for sure. I recently just finished like what three hours ago to um, the Barbican podcast with you and Amru and in it you both talk about your relationship with spirituality, um, Islam, sexuality and I just wanted to know at that point you said that you there was I'm paraphrasing please correct me if I'm doing something wrong I think Amru talks about Sufism and being queer and the journey that they're on right now. And you basically say you're on sim that similar journey in defining your relationship to religion and sexuality. And I just wondered at what point are you on right now where, with your relationship in that? And do the scriptures of religion ever damper that thinking for you? And how do you balance that? Because I, was, I, I example that in a way of when I got to understand the nuances of my sexuality, I was like, I can no longer call myself a Muslim. Mm -hmm. And there are wonderful projects that would reach out, such as like the Queer Muslim Project, that I was like, in my way of how my understanding is, I don't know if I can be a part of it. Because for me, in my thinking, I was like, who I am differs from religion and I don't want to disrespect somebody or disrespect the scriptures of something. I rather be who I am and keep the keep the values of religion, what teaches us, right? Like be a good person, all those things, like keep those values, but not call myself something. So I was just trying to understand where are you in that way of thinking? And would you ever have any wisdom for people like myself who think like that? It's a big one. I mean... <laughs> yeah, there's no little questions. <laughs> besides, like, kind of, you're talking about ducky at the beginning of this call, okay? So, like, don't give me that. We went and really did that. Um, I suppose maybe starting, like, with where I am, I'm certainly at the very beginning of a journey. And I feel like, in a way, I will always be at the beginning of a journey or, like, I will never at least be at the end point of it when it comes to yeah. the question. And that's fair and fine because that's also just the nature of religion, I think. But I suppose where I am is, like, I feel quite comfortable in the understanding now that culture and religion are very different. That in Islam particularly, these things have become so enmeshed that I don't know where things originate from. Like for example, Amru talks about in their book, this notion of, or maybe it's not in their book, maybe it was just in the podcast, but like how um, the story of, I think it's Lut or Lot in English, um, but like the one where like, and again, I'm super paraphrasing here. No, no, go. But I'm no scholar, so I'm going to excuse myself from that. But, like, basically, um, a prophet who went to the city, saw that people were sinning. God was like, okay, take your people, leave the city, don't look back. But his wife looked back, and she got turned into a pillar of salt. But, like, the main thing about it was, like, why were the people sinning? And then I think where this came out is, like, this is where, like, the whole, you know, no gay people comes from, uh, apparently, which is that the people were sinning because it was men sleeping with men. But also, if there, there are other interpretations that Amru was mentioning about, actually, no, it's not about. It's that there were people non-consensually having sex with each other. They were raping each other. And actually, that's the origin of the sin there. And that's why that whole city was condemned. And so there's a whole heap of research that I would have to do in order to unpick those things. And the thing is, it's hard, right? Because like time is limited. I don't think that it's my vocation to go and become a Muslim scholar 
and to go and find these things out. I think there are women and there are people for whom that is their vocation. But like, I need to start figuring out what it is that I need to know the difference between. As a basis, I think that means going and reading the Quran. And as a basis for that, that means going and learning Arabic. And that mm -hmm. also a heck of a lot of research into these things. And that's a long process. And I look at that sometimes and sometimes I don't feel ready for it. Because there's also this element, which again, that wonderful Imam Imam had said to me, which was that like, for example, in Islam, you have a really direct relationship with Allah. You don't have a priest or an interlocutor to like give you confession or to tell you what to do to seek forgiveness. That's just between you and God. And so it's the same with your relationship with the Quran. Like you can't have someone, you can have people like teach it to you, but that's very different from like them teaching you what the letters mean and what the words mean and like what the general historical context of it. You going and finding what that meaning means for yourself is really, really different. And I guess that's the reason that I've, been able to stay a Muslim like you like I believe in those big tenets I believe in something bigger than myself that is one that is there's an element of oneness and I believe in those elements that tell you to strive to be a good person and to seek to do all that you can for your identity as pure as possible those kinds of things and the rest is for me very much situated in social justice it's situated in feminism in equity and it's also situated in critical thinking and seeking to understand for yourself what things mean. But those, like, that's where I am on my journey, kind of like understanding that that's the road ahead of me, that if I'm gonna be serious about being what, in my eyes, is a good Muslim, is that I need now to not be content with the knowledge that I have, but to keep seeking that in whatever form and to keep trying to do things or trying to understand in a good-hearted, in good way going forward. And that's about all I can say on that. That links me to my next question, which is he, in a lot of my re article research of you, there was discussions of being a woman, your queer journey, um, how you you had this discussion with your mom being mixed raced. And we had a joke about like being fetishized earlier. But do do you feel like in those identities that you ever have to compartmentalize them or do they all relish in each other or fight? Like for me, it's an ever battle when it comes to sometimes when I live life day to day, I have to categorize those things. And I feel like I can never just be, be in the space. Do you feel like that ever or not really? Mm. It's an interesting one. I feel like these things for me are quite fluid and mm -hmm. In a way, they've almost always felt quite fluid because that's just been my experience. Like, for example, nationality wise, you hear it in my accent. I'm both British and, and like people always ask, do you feel more British or do you feel more American? And it's like, I feel the both. ever question. Like, I feel both. And it's actually more interesting to me that people almost need to hear me say what I feel more of. Like, it's, it says more about them that they feel the need to ask that question than anything else. Like, it's a bit like, who cares? <laughs> really in the grand scheme of things like maybe it's important in a particular context but seriously who gives a fuck like everyone has got some combination of something no one is purely anything unless you're like a nazi but even then like you know hitler had brown hair what are you gonna do about that yeah, but, but the like, term mixed race uh, like even in casting sometimes when it comes down right like i don't know if you've ever experienced this as a performer mixed race always means black and white yeah and I'm just like, no, I'm mixed race to your mixed race to there's other variations of it. What's your mix? I didn't know you were mixed. I'm half uh, Punjabi, half Turkish. Ew. Ew. I didn't know that. Ew. I didn't know that. Yeah. And I mean, heck, again, like, and this comes from the work that I do. I feel like all of these terms are so arbitrary. Like, <laughs> Say that one more time. Say that one more time. You could be dual something. You could be like, <laughs> Turkish, Punjabi, like, honestly, they're just, uh, I, I mean, I guess in some terms, I understand the need to label, right? Like, I feel like at first, the trend will be, we need to label everything in order to understand it. We need to have vocabularies for these things. And then at some point, these things won't matter anymore. And like, we don't quite live in that world yet where these things don't mm -hmm. matter yet. I personally feel as though I'm so comfortable with all of the interlinks and facets of my identity that now when anyone asks me questions about this like I get irritated I get bored it's like really that's the most like and not not with you sorry I don't mean to like <laughs> no that. no it's so fine I I know it's so fine but like just like yeah in general in life I'm like who cares 
Like seriously, who cares? And maybe sure, like you're trying to find a way to relate to me or to understand me, or maybe you're just finding a way to try and put me in a box. But like, really? Ask me something else. Ask me something more interesting like, than, you know, where I come from. Although I guess that is a deep and profound question, la la. But the way people ask it, they don't be like, you know, oh, what's where are you really from? Yeah, yeah but like, that. where are you really from? And then you go, but do you like girls or do you like boys? All right, oh, which one's better? Oh, your notion of gender is outdated. Bye. Uh, hi, 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 hi. Should we move on? Or do you want to say one more thing before we move on? Don't ask stupid questions. <laughs> before I discuss Queer Parivar, this is what Shift London says. It says you. It's weird, maybe I've fallen into the trap of writing about things that hurt me because of this idea of a tortured artist, you know. But being queer hasn't really hurt me. I'm lucky to not have experiences of that. For me, it has never been about pain or suppression. So keeping that in mind and how Shiva approached you to write this beautiful, joyful experience that is queer for you I wanted to understand how was it from that experience to now from birth to now and what has like changed and what have you learned about yourself through this beautiful process i mean this is certainly experience has put me in touch with a heck of a lot more queer south asians i think is one big point of difference and i think what that's allowed me to do is sometimes i do get too self-righteous with it sometimes i am like oh do you, you know all brown parents are like that. Some brown parents actually like their kids. And it's like, okay, Amani, that's nice. That's really not useful. That's not like all <laughs> framing, considering that there are so many people who get disowned or kicked out or killed. Like, and so there is a particular way to tell that. And what I'm really grateful to Shiva for was like actually finding the ap appropriate, maybe I guess is the word, but like the right way to tell that story. And like, I suppose the right offering rather than kind of this preachy like we're not all like that because like the reality is so many of us are yeah. and yeah and that's a privilege on my part but I guess maybe what else has changed and like what that process was like I guess the other thing is just I learned and thought so much more about marriage than anything else which is and the thing is like I've never been the type of kid to like grow up thinking I want to wear this or I want my ceremony to be like that the reality is in my much everyone's divorced someone's cheated on someone we've just known like half my family it's all very unhealthy and so truly like I didn't ever want to think about marriage I never wanted to think about kids and it's only more recently and through the writing of this film that I really had to interrogate that both like for the purposes of the film but also in my own life because you write from what you know and speaking to because we did lots of interviews with different queer couples to be like, you know, what does marriage mean to you? What's your relationship been like? You know, you need to get married. And hearing all of those answers, I think, helped me come to terms with what my answer to those questions would be and has put me in a lot more peace with these things. And the thing is, it's hard, right? Like, for example, I, I would want to get married. I think what that means for me is something quite different. So, like, for example, I had a friend who got married and she said to me, mm -hmm. yeah, but and my partner, um, we, we don't think that marriage really has to be forever we've accepted that if it doesn't work out that's totally fine and when she said it like that I like there was just so much pressure that got released and it was like oh yeah <laughs> and I, that fits with the whole world view I've seen where no one ever does seem to stay together and staying together is entirely rare and now mm. it's just like I commit to being with you for as long as possible and for as long as it's healthy for us and I'm cool with that but what more can you ask for right like I think I, you're right like, the other thing is that, like, again, when I would be, like, running off crying to my best friend's house when all of this shit was going down at mine, her parents, like, were together and still are together. And, like, they have a very wonderful marriage. And I remember asking her, I was like, Renee, how do you two do it? Like, how do you and Teddy stay together? And she was like, well, the secret is that people change all the time, right? And, like, you fall in and out of love. But mm. more about the fact that you commit to being with that person, regardless of the changes that they go through, my addendum, as long as that's healthy, and, um, and that they do the same for you. And I was like, okay, Th again, that's a definition I can fuck with. <laughs> Are you fetishizing my writing? Yeah. Oh, I get off. I got off to it this morning already. What are you talking about? Oh, that's not something I ever thought my writing would do. <laughs> would you not? Um, if anybody has ever gotten off to Amani's writing, please let us know. And... Oh my! Please don't! Please don't! 
I don't want to know. <laughs> Please do. Let us know how it started. Was it the voice that got to you? Was it the ASMR? What was it? Was it the one where she's um, doing the chai piece and she's grinding on the floor? Because that was sexy as hell because I'm Grinding's into that. <laughs> oh, slam jams. I have never been to one. What's a slam jam? You mentioned slam jams and I was like, is that just like a rap battle or is that live performances? You talked about slam jams somewhere. And I was like, what is slam jams? Is it just like learning work? I mean, I don't ever recall having said slam jam, but if you've on all of your research, I've said it once, fine. I accept Probably. It. Let's just talk about then live work because I have never done live performance work when it comes to spoken word or poetry. And I was just wondering, in this new world of digitization, how do you think that fits in for a, um, for a medium that is, for me, so, I don't want to use the word romantic because that's only my memory of, like, listening to, like, works of, like, Alam Iqbal or, like, Rumi. There's such a, there's a, such a fantasy to it that I think the digital the digitized experience of it can sometimes like even though i put out videos of it is not similar to a live experience like similar to like dancing work right so i want to understand you having put out video content as well where do you fit in that world today as well as how has your first poem of charlie hebdo is it hebdo hebdo wow that's a throwback yeah, the first poem you wrote was about Charlie Hebdo. Um, if you remember it, please say it right now. How has that differed to your last piece that you wrote? Okay. So talking about digital first, and I feel like that especially came through over the pandemic when all of us got forced online and we were doing slams online, for example, like the pizza, the roundhouse slam that I was See, doing. slam jams, slam jams. Slam! <laughs> you can you call it slam jam, babe. You call it whatever you want. But like the first slam that I did in the pandemic was online and then like moved into a live space. And yeah. like to, I kind of avoid digital platforms now unless it's like a purposeful, like almost like poetry music video type live. Um, just because I find it really hard. I think the beauty of live performances is that it's not just you performing. Like, yeah, sure, it's what you are saying, what emotions you are bringing to your performance, but it's also that real time feedback loop you're getting from the audience where you can see either that people are vibing with you or not. And you really can't do that on Zoom because it's not just about like what people's faces are doing. It's about like their body language. It's about the aura you feel for like a lack of a word, but you can feel an energy in a space, right? Like you can feel yeah. when people are connected. Also like when people are on their screens, they might be looking at the screen but unless that you can see the glare in their glasses, they might be doing a thousand other things at the same time. So it is just very hard to have an accurate gauge of how people are thinking and how people are feeling about your piece. And it loses that magic. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Do you think a uh, spoken word or artist or poet needs to go through that experience in order to authenticate or call themselves that? Uh, yeah, I mean, what's the litmus test really? The thing, like, the thing that I love about this whole world is that there are rules. And sure, other people might say things and put things on you, but it's about how you feel. If you've gone up on a stage once and performed something, sure, you could call yourself whatever you want. You can call yourself a poet or not. If you write in the corner of your room and never show anyone, but maybe you just, like, read it to yourself in the mirror or even lock it in a drawer, sure, you're still a poet. Like, it's just about how you feel about it and what makes you feel as though you've done something, quote, authentically. Like, for me, personally... I didn't think I would be satisfied and I just had that feeling until mm. the writing and I shared it with other people. And that's because of the purpose of why I do spoken words specifically. I do it to connect with people. I do it because I want those reactions from people. Maybe sometimes I want that validation from people. It's giving me something as much as I'm offering something. And that's the beauty of the loop. And again, that's also what I feel lost in digital spaces and what I welcome so much more in the live. Did you early on find the the musicality and the way your pieces have a specific 
voice and a rhythm did you know that that was going to be kind of like a signature or would you say you're still figuring that sort of structure out and the previous question that i asked as well which was how has your writing progressed from that charlie piece that you wrote to now maybe we can answer both at the same time so yeah the way that i wrote that it actually came out i can't even describe how that happened so i'd gone to a slide that i wrote that university um, Charlie Hebdo, by the way, is the name of that French newspaper that had depicted a, an image of the Prophet Muhammad, which as we know, like in Islam, that's not something you meant to yeah. do. And then those people from Daesh or wherever they were from came and like killed people in the headquarters yeah. Yeah. doing that. It was a big uproar and then Charlie Hebdo was like, ah, oh, free speech. And it was just like, for those who are listening, that was two middle fingers up in the air. But um. There was, so like I went to a slam for the first time. <laughs> I saw how people were performing. I was like, ooh, I've been writing on the page. I've explored what it would be like to read something out loud properly. Um, do I want to write like that? But I just know that it left me buzzing. It left me with something. And then the next time I went to write a poem, I really cannot explain it. It just came out the way it did. And it came out rhyming. It came out with like meter. It came out with rhythm. Like that's how it just happened. And who knows, maybe that's like, that's probably just the sum of all of my influences, right? Like I listened to a lot of rap. My mom brought me up on Missy Elliott. Like I listened to a lot of Kendrick. Um, and then there's also like the aspects of theater and drama that come out in that. And that's something that I've always enjoyed. Um, so these things kind of what I'd been consuming unconsciously, maybe somewhat consciously. And again, so long ago, I don't even remember. I just remember the feeling of it, like almost splurging out onto the paper. And I think maybe the difference between then and now is that it's actually a lot harder for me to access that. And I think the reason okay. for that is that I've stopped going to gigs. Like in that space very early on, I was in that very humble space of going and begging for an open mic slot. I was, you know, going around to all of the places, listening to everything, refining kind of like what I thought was good poetry or at least the poetry that I wanted to be writing like or identifying the things that I thought were good, because I know that that's all very subjective. And I was pulling those things into my practice. And as time went on, I started moving from those open mic slots to being the headliner. And like, again, you go and you listen. But as I started moving toward those headline slots, I stopped going to all of the open mics. And I found that oh. everything kind of dried up in a way. And then, you know, the next time I went to an open mic or the next time I heard something that was really good, I'd feel that itch to write again. And so, the process now feels very different. It feels much more labored. I feel like I have to get through a lot more drafts. I feel now sometimes instead of letting things splurge out, I will go back through my journals. I will find certain lines that I like and I will stitch them together in some kind of patchwork and edit the heck out of them if I like them. So there are lots of different ways, I suppose, in it for me now. Do you like the laborness of it or not really? I mean, it annoys me. <laughs> Because, like, it just it used to feel so wow. Like, sometimes I really remember, like, the pieces that I perform that people seem to like the most and the pieces that I write that I am genuinely proud of still, they just happen in that sploosh. I'm like, yeah, yeah I tired editing. But, man, some of the stuff that came out just felt very, like, I was like, whoa, how the hell did I write that? Like, it is annoying, especially when I feel like it's almost a capability that I've lost. But, I yeah. don't know, I'm trying to find the learning in it. Maybe it's teaching me that... I was lucky and I got earlier on and now I've got to kind of do what basically everyone else does, which is to labor through lots of different drafts until I get to somewhere that I'm mildly happy to share. Um, but it's ways into it. Right. And I'm sure that like, that isn't the end of the ability to just have an outpouring. I'm sure that will come back at the moments where it is necessary or where my body is like, yep, that's okay. It's time to let something out. <laughs> My question is, in how much you share, be that of your work, be that of your posts, be that on your social, there's there's a bareness to you, which you just expressed, you just discuss and you just, there it is. But others' interpretation of it or others taking in of it, does that ever affect you or do you always find that interesting? Because I found this quote by Desi Blitz, which they wrote about your work. Very nice. Said strength as a poet. She has a refined ability to mitigate a lack of reservation with a highly intelligent humor. Did they say that about me? They said that about you. And also, do you ever get backlash on certain things that you put out? 
and not backlash but do you know what i mean like yeah i you know i find it so bizarre that someone is so straightforward as me hasn't gotten much backlash or at least not much that i've seen i think the oh, one do you want me to report you i can do that i mean do you know what do you want to be my hater then that means i've won by all means my hater. but um yeah i like it's like i've never received a dick pic in my life and i'm just a bit like what i find it to chop your dick off Addicted. I have it as well. Do you know I talked about this with Shiva? I have never received a dick pic on my Instagram. When I knew Shiva in 2016, I opened up their Instagram and there were dick pics and ass pics and I was so jealous. I was jealous. Did you know what? I'm not because it's like please don't. I don't want to see all of that. Thank you. But I like I experience it. I don't and I don't know whether Send us your dick pics, you guys. Please send us your dick pics. Uh, and Rai, all of your dick pics. He clearly and I'll forward it on to Amani. Please send it to us. Oh, uh, please don't. I really don't want them. Um, but yeah, I just I haven't received that much. And like the same with backlash. I think there was maybe one time it was I can't remember, like on the BBC or the post, it was a while ago, and like I posted yeah. um or they posted a poem that I'd done. And like there were some comments and it was like, I think the ones that really pissed me off weren't like, you know, fuck this opinion because sure, people are gonna have that opinion. It was more of the ones that was like, and it was so strange. It was like, she seems like such a sweet, nice girl. It's a sh so strange that she's having these opinions. Like, and it was written by some like old white person from Devon. And I was like, hey, do you think- I'm Shout out to Devon. Because I'm like a brown Muslim woman who you think is submissive and is not going to have an opinion when really we are the ones who have the biggest opinions. Like, have you met an auntie in your life, please? But like, there's like, a, a part of that, I can't remember any. And I don't know whether that's, you know, a sign of me and whether I look like I'm so scary that people feel that they can't do that. Hell yeah. You don't look scary. You're beautiful. Don't say that. Well, thank you. But also if it's an armor, I'm going to take that. But like, yeah. Or maybe people just haven't engaged with it, or maybe I'm followed by people who the algorithm is only showing my stuff to people who agree with me. Like, I, I really, I just do not understand. What does it take for Amani to get a dick pic? Send a dick pic to Amani's <laughs> account! Fuck off! She'll take tits, she'll take dicks, she'll take no, ass. I do get she'll those! She'll take a Batanya picture. All of the nudes I've ever gotten have been from women. Oh. Oh, the topic turns. <laughs> Look, she's stroking your beard. Like, yeah, it's been very strange. Like, that has been the one that I've gotten. And again, I don't know whether like troll bots or whatever, but like truly, it's just, I've always found that very bizarre. And it was especially after I came out. So many people being like, hi, are you a lesbian? Like, are you interested in girls? Do you want to meet me? Do you want to be my girlfriend? Oh, you have a boyfriend? That doesn't really matter. Come be with me. And it's like, it's so wild. I, yeah, baffling. What, were they beautiful at least? Were they like beautiful nudes at least? Like Titanic, like Rose paint me like one of your French girls situation? Not really. No, they were all ugly because I didn't ask for them. God. Oh, what? Like seriously, I'm not much of a nudes gal. Like, and it's because of an experience I had with a partner a while ago. Like, I, okay. I, I, don't, I'm, I don't put much sock in them. I think that like people are better in real life because then you can actually touch them. But like all of that kind of thing. I mean, she got the box, but like. <laughs> <laughs> Things you miss about uh, and embrace about your life in the States versus the UK. Pizza and bagels. Ooh, I've never had a New York pizza and I really want to go to a shoddy place where you pay $1 for that oh, shitty. Oh, yo, I miss that so much. You do not get the same here. I do not care what anyone tells you. You really don't. You really don't. I really want to try that. And so one day we'll go to New York and we'll do that. Um, performing similar pieces again. Is it similar to like being an actor or like a dancer where sometimes finding the passion for doing that same piece, be it having to redo that video again and again, is lethargic or you just have to pull on certain things? Like how do you, how's that ex experience for you? And do you have any methods that you pull on? Yeah, I mean... This is the problem. I've written so little lately by way of poetry that I am having to perform the same things over and over again. And like, to an extent, yeah, I will get bored. And that is the time and impetus for me to be like, come on, bitch, write something new. Just so you don't get bored with your own performances and the audience can see that and then no one's invested or involved. But like, there's also an element where a poem is like a vessel and every time you perform it's a different poem. And that's something that got taught to me when I was doing words first way back when, when I was just starting out doing spoken word. 
um, we were really lucky. We got Kay Tempest to come and they literally oh, wow. listened to every single one of our poems and gave us feedback. And then like gave us a little like masterclass and they were saying, and Amira Leon was also there and she's phenomenal. And like what they were both saying was that like every time you perform, obviously it's never going to be the same, right? Because your intonation is different. The feelings that you were bringing are different. And the most important thing is not to think that you must perform a certain poem in a certain way. So like, oh yeah, they told of this, like this poem, like I wrote it with my dad, it's got sad themes, therefore I must perform it with tears in my eyes. Actually what's interesting is bringing whatever feeling you are feeling that day into yeah. the poem. And that authenticity um, and makes you not feel like very bored of your own work. But also is like exciting, surprising, right? Like. If I write a poem about being raped and I can do that like as if I'm furious, as if I'm miserable, as if I'm triumphant because I've overcome it. These are all very, very different approaches and different things and they make the poem different. So yeah, well, sometimes it can be much to have done the same poem every night multiple times. And again, there are like overlaps in audiences. So that's never interesting for an audience to come and see you doing the same repertoire over and over either. Um, there is still a way that you could make these things interesting and new by yourself. My next question is, <clears throat> removing it all, I read in regards to you coming out and having a discussion in regards to your sexuality with your family, and there was something in regards to aunties mentioning something and your mom going, so what, basically, if I'm paraphrasing? And I always think, regardless of if you're creative or not, the the things that the pillars that make us who we are is the love and support of our family, the unconditional love and support of our family, our confidence, our faith, our spirituality, and our circles, right? So if we don't have these pillars and, or they're very shaky pillars, it's very, it's a very troubling space for you to find yourself and who you are and for you to love yourself. So my question into you is, if you remove that support and love of your family, the success or the accolades that you have had through your career, and it was a stumbling rocky road, would you still continue to do what you're doing today? And would you still be in a similar mindset that you are today? Do you think you'll find your way to where you are today? Mm. It's an interesting question. I guess it's tough to answer as a hypothetical because like there, their support is different things, right? Like, again, it's not as though I perform for their validation and love. And they need something like poetry that's deeply uncomfortable for them. And sometimes against their wishes, like this is one poem I have, a couple poems that I have. Like my mom, she's the one who hears all my poems first. Like the first, oh. she'll always hear them. She'll be the first one to hear them. And then she'll be like, yay, that was wonderful. I hated that line, but I really liked it. <laughs> like, you know? And and then there are sometimes where she'll be like, I poems I Do you take it on? Like, sometimes I mean like feedback's feedback right and like yeah. sometimes she'll be like I don't like that you use the words whiskey and Quran in the same sentence and it's like mom this is you know I understand why you feel that way but also this is like my experience and like I somehow do manage both and then there will be other times where she'll be like I think that went on too long and I'll be like do you know what actually yeah that's pretty valid probably right about that and like even like the former critique I'll be like okay fine like, I don't agree with that. But now that I've heard you say that, I know that that's how members of an audience might perceive it. And maybe that's something that I can address in a preamble. You know, yeah. it's all useful. But yeah, I guess, so is the question you're asking me basically, like, could I have done what I've done without the love and support of my family? Yeah. Not in the same way. No. No. And I think, and like, well, no, not in the same way. Like, would, have I become, would I have become a poet? I think so, because I've been writing since I was very young. But like also my parents pushed me to do these things and like I'm very strong willed, but would I have gone for as many opportunities? Would they have showed me or like would the things like the access and the things that they'd shown me if we hadn't had a close relationship, I wouldn't have had those things. I wouldn't have had points of reference like Nostra Fatali Khan or like, you know, Khalid. Oh. Those things would be gone and those would be missing. And that would mean fundamentally that I would be both a very different person and a very different poet. So, yeah. I mean, I feel like that's an of course. And, and like, there are so many people though, like, and that's to say, like, of course we will be different based on whether we do or do not have these things, but yeah, whatever person we end up becoming, 
that is who we were meant to become and like the things that we figured out and the absences or the presences that we've had are just things that shape us not things that define us i think that is up to us as far as possible right like excluding obvious privileges excluding obvious disadvantages like the rest of it i think if it's in your destiny it's in your destiny two quick question and then we're going to play some game digital spacing and your understanding of it where are you today with your relationship with the digital space i always find this an interesting question in the world that we live in where there's influencer poets such as um good old what's her name rupi kaur i have so many strong feelings but, about rupi kaur but my question is there are people who who get transferable skills and jobs and and progress industries and bring light to certain industries which is great you know if that works for them that works for them but I always do question when like let's say people don't have a 10k following or people don't have x amount of like likes on their views and you know that is their bread and butter so like in that balancing world what is your thoughts on the digital space or your relationship with it and what is the ultimate gift for you which is like what is the the journey that you see yourself if the world was your oyster you would be like this is my job this is what i'm going to be doing in 10 years this is going to be this and after this i'm going to feel like mm. Mm. so sorry that was quite rude about rupee car i shouldn't have done no, that no it's not rude i think people should have oh, their i know she means a lot to a lot of people and i wouldn't like that if someone did that about me if i had any haters for fuck's sake like <laughs> right like okay so i suppose there's about how you write and like i talked earlier about audience and about understanding your audience but also like how you write and who you write for and i feel like as while you're informed again by the environment that you're around primarily the things that you write should be for you like that's your first audience for me anyway or that's the person i write for first what are the things that i need to say and that i need to see on a piece of paper outside of my body and then it's okay what do i want to share and for me like yeah that always has to be the first thing and i think a lot of people in the digital space do this well and like they were we're figuring that out but also the nature of it being social there are times i think when people forget to write for themselves first and again like that is me being judgmental there's no really true way to say that about a person because only a writer would know that like whether they've said the thing that they need to say for themselves before they've gone and said it to other people so like with Ruby Carr for example like maybe that's genuinely what she really needs to say and like there's so much to be said for how much she has done in terms of being the representation that young south asian girls and women seem to have needed or at least has been the gate into the western publishing world for those women and like that's a wonderful thing but also at the same time what i really dislike about her work and the short digestible almost like instagram oriented nature of it and again like this is my fault that i don't know whether she put things on instagram first or whether that's just how she writes her stuff um but i'm assuming that it's for like the instagram posts and what not cuz a lot of people do that kind of like insta poetry where it fits on a square is that that innately does always feel like it's for other people like the nature yeah. of work for example is like it's really it's so generic and for that reason like what's clever about it from a marketing perspective is that it's very seemingly universal like she'll talk about generic brown girl trauma pain mud huts and like for me that's not where the power of writing ever is the power of writing is in like that uniqueness that specificity that individuality that thing that only you can offer right i feel like and again maybe this is what people say about like really abstract artists i feel like anyone could have written that I feel like a computer algorithm could have generated that, you know, based off of the inputs of a lot of other things. And again, they didn't yeah. write those things. She did put those things out. Who knows? Maybe secretly this is just me being nuzzer and I'm jealous because I want to be like Rupi Kaur, I want to be popular too. But like it just it makes me angry that kind of writing. Yeah. Because it's like you don't speak for all of us. No one can speak for all of us. And like when you write in that way, it's like you're writing for an audience, you know? and like is do you really think that you are writing on behalf of every single one of us maybe you don't claim to but like the way that your writing is being picked up that's what it feels like and like again yeah. put things out into the world and maybe if you write for yourself first and there's like a tension and maybe I'm contradicting myself here but it's just like who are you in all of this and like also what behalf what right do you have to speak on behalf of all of us 
I think I've moved a lot away from your question. But um, yeah, digital space. It was on the digital space, but it's so good. You just have to be mindful of. And like, again, maybe this is a question of like what you intend as a writer and like also knowing how things be interpreted to the many readers that you put things out on the digital sphere of. But like, I feel like there's a responsibility there as a writer. <laughs> and the ultimate give. One would be a night, like a party or something similar, community poetry night whatever form that might take that is self-sustaining and that can run without me right. and that's really hard knowing who I am a person but that's an ambition right like that's a, that's a, an end point I want to end up getting to being to being able to like create something resource it well enough have people that I trust to lead it and then who go on to give it something of their own and then be able to die in peace and still have it be a thing but like think of Club Kali What's gonna happen when DJ Rithu doesn't want to run that anymore? You know, I don't think it's gonna disappear. I think she's gonna find that going, even in like a different. Like, yeah. Need to exist. I mean, I don't know. Maybe I'm putting words in her mouth, right? But like, it's existed for so long, and I feel like it must continue to exist. But anyway, something like that. And then I think the other thing, and like Shiva's really whet my appetite for this, especially kind of having been behind the scenes of QP and like seeing how it all worked on set. I really want to write my own film. I would like to have my my big idea. I would like to write a script. I would like to produce and direct. And again, like with the right team, but like yeah. just the vision for something like that and executing it, I think would be massive and is something I would love to do. It would just be so much fun. But yeah, those are my those are my gifts. Well, the time has come for you to play. Super child, play with Rai! It's the game section. All right, the first section, by the way, Super child, play with Rai is if you don't want to play specific section or not answer, you sip your chai. But if you want to do it, you play with Rai. That sounds wrong, but you know what I mean. So this is rapid. You got to be rapid in this, all right? No more flapping. Right. The first section is if I was. So if I was to say to you, if I was a color, what would you be? You go blah, blah, blah. Ready? Okay, if I was a movie, what would the title of that movie be? First thing that comes to your mind. Quit by the back! If, it already exists for sure. If, <laughs> it's not a movie about you. If I was a movie, what would the title of that movie be? Would you, of oh, you were a movie. You, you, you. If I was a movie, what would the title be? Yeah. Oh, Lost and Confused. What would the uh, storyline be of Lost and Confused? Uh, a coming of age story of that is so boringly autobiographical of a queer Muslim woman finding her way in life, probably in a big city in the Western world. Wow. What, what would the theme or the title song of Lost and what was it? Lost and Confused. I don't Lost know. What would the theme song be? Would it be I don't know? Is that it? I mean, if there's a song called I Don't Know, probably, but I imagine maybe something by the late parts that's a lot of screaming and banging on drums and saying, I don't know. I don't know. All right. Who would it star? Go. Ah, it would star. This is hard, yo. Uh, it would star. Why is this give so me, difficult, right? Give me one or two. Okay, now. All right. If I was a drink, what would I be? A glass of champagne. If I was a food, what would I be? Hot perota. If I was a fruit, what would I be? A juicy, juicy mango. If I was a dessert, what would I be? Glove jamming. My face is round, isn't it? If I was a color, what would I be? Blue. If I was a clothing item, what would I be? A pair of chuckles. If I was a... <laughs> 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 so you can beat people with it. If I was a flower or a plant, what would I be? Be a lily. Okay, quickly. Have you ever farted whilst performing? No. Have you ever hooked up with a fellow artist or an admirer? No. Have you ever flirted to get ahead? I probably have, but wasn't aware that I was doing it. People tell me I'm very flirty. Okay. Have you ever joined the Mile High Club? No. Have you ever peed whilst swimming? Yes. Have you ever forgotten words and made it up on the spot? Yeah. What would you rather? Be rich or famous? Famous. What would, you, what would you rather? Critical acclaim or win lots of awards? Um, critical acclaim. What would you rather? Netflix or Prime? Or... Uh, Madhuri or Ashwarya? Madhuri. Roundhouse or Barbican? 
barbican. Gulab jamun, or I can't pronounce this. It's, it's an Iraqi dessert. It's called, it's spelled K-L-E-I-C-H-A. Kleita? Gulab jamun. Okay. Heels or Timberlands? I'm Timberlands made in Israel. Gotta have to say heels. Okay. Sari or Lenga? Sorry, now that I've learned how to wear one. All right. The next section is called Russian Roulette. Have you ever watched Cypher, BET Cypher? No. Okay. Well, basically, you're going to freestyle spoken word slash poetry, and you have to add these three words into it. Are you ready? You are. Okay. okay. You have to freestyle a poetry. It can be about any topic, but you have to include the three following words in it. Nikah, watermelon, and the color blue. Ready? I'm going to give you five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one, go. It was the first day of Ramadan. I really wished I was having my nikah. But instead of having my nikah with the Shah, I <laughs> fasted, alhamdulillah. And at the end of the evening for iftar, I had some watermelon because it's got water. And when the sky became blue again, I hey! think, I don't know. I totally made that up. That was I will end for this. All right, you got two more to do. The next one, you have to add the words sand, rhinestones, and shy. Like, I saw shy. Okay, ready? Five seconds in five, four, three, two, one, go. And just like the sky was blue, the sand was also blue because we were in a surrealist desert where all of the grains were rhinestones and I forgot the other word, but we're just gonna make it up go. What was the other word? I don't know. No, you did it, you did it. That was the three words. All what right. Okay. Yeah, well done you, go you. Hey. All right, last one. Your next three words are dear, heartbreak, sword. Wait, and there's an, a bonus word. There's a bonus word if you want to add it. A paranda. What does that even mean? A paranda is, you, have you ever braided your hair and you add that Indian thing or that South Asian thing? The Pakistan, uh, the, 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 that's called the paranda. Wait, what are the three words again? <laughs> so you got deer. Deer. Heartbreak. Heartbreak. Sword. Sword. All right. In five, four, three, two, one, go. Dearly beloved, please do not break my heart with a sword because if you did, that would be boring because every single poem starts with heartbreak and no more shall I swap my pen for my sword. I don't know. <laughs> yes! No more shall I swap my pen for a sword. That's a good line. Fuck off. Anyway. That's a, that's that, a was good... that was fun. That was fun. I would have done that in workshops or something. Like That's a good, uh, that's a good technique. Do it. Okay, the next section is called, this is the last section, it's called Snaps for Katie. Snaps for Katie from Legally Blonde Katie? Snaps. I just uh, wanted to say, but like you know where she's like, snap, snap, snaps. So I usually do this where I play a video of the guest's medium of work, I stop it and they have to continue on. So since you've done extensive amount of poems, what I'm going to do is play a piece of your poem and then I'm going to stop it and you have to say the next let's say two lines. Okay. Let's do this one first. I'm telling you to get out. I want the past to reassert itself when it's taken the women in my family four generations to arrive. Amina married off at 15. Nani I may not be married off at 15. Nani John babied and pregnant again at 17. Mother engaged three months after she meets the man who will cheat on her 20 years later. It's time to make that immigrant dream mean something, to leave the men behind and to let birth a life. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right, let's see. But it's been three years and I'm not waiting for you to leave anymore. I'm telling you to get out. I want the past to reassert itself when it's taken the women in my family four generations to arrive. Amina married off at 15. Nani John babied and pregnant. Yeah. Her mother engaged three months after she meets the man who will leave her 20 years later. It's time to make that impact. Okay. All right. Okay. Got that. Got that. Got that. All right. Ready? Mm -hmm. For the next one. Where is it gone? This is the one that, um, obviously, I told you about. I, I did stuff too. Not this one. This isn't your work. This is just an ad. Say, I sound good. I just saw this, I just did. All right. 
I was told to write my own truths. Somehow, being brown is always one of them. But I don't want to tell you about being a brown girl. See, I don't speak for brown girls. There you go. I don't speak for brown girls. Because like we assume white individuality, how we separate their shades of pearl, alabaster, cream, there are different shades of chai, coffee, and tea. Okay. Okay, somebody's very confident. By the way, can I just say, I watched this video of you on Instagram in front of a mic, where you just say the first line 15 times and there's a noise just blocking you, like what? rudely interrupting you. Oh, yes, that was part of a roundhouse gig. That I was, was like... I was like, what the hell is happening? All right, let's see. Because like we assume white individuality. Oh, okay. How we separate their shades of pearl, alabaster, cream. There are different shades of chai, coffee, and tea. I'm very much here for this outfit, by the way, I just want to say. Thank you. It's a beautiful outfit. Okay, the next one isn't really... Um, I spy with my little eye her iPhone screen. She's popping to Florence in the machine, but I guess you don't notice our our interpretation of culture brush the map between our fingers like water. <laughs> Somebody just knows this shit, don't they? Okay. Okay. Well done. Well done. You are the first person to ever get it right. Usually everybody oh fucks God. up. That was good, but luckily it's the three poems that I've been to repeat. So thank you for that. <laughs> listen, 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 listen. Listen, Linda, Linda, honey. Well, that brings us to the end, and that is the end of the game. What words of wisdom would you say to your mirror self today? Don't take yourself so seriously. Don't be so hard on yourself. Don't be so and hard on yourself. Oh. Hey. I'm here for this. Last one. Um, a peak in a valley is a question I ask everybody. Peak is a high point of your personal or professional life. What was it? What lesson you learned from it? The valley is a low personal or professional point of your life. What was it? What lesson you learned from it? Go. Peak of my professional working life. Currently now, actually, I'm in a place where I've got a good work-life balance. I'm enjoying everything to do with writing. I'm also enjoying my consultancy. I'm making so much money that I can like help my family out, that I can go on holiday, that I can save, and that's a really beautiful thing. And I feel like all of these elements of my life currently complement each other, and that the people that I work with in every area of my life are understanding they're inclusive, they're kind, they get it, they prioritize mental health and well-being, and they're just good people. Valley, probably when I was working in the civil service, probably uh, when I was working in the particular department in anti-racism, and I was surrounded by entirely the opposite, people who did not get it, or if people could get it, they weren't in positions of power where they could help, and we're all just kind of suffering together. It really took an impact on my mental health, it really took an impact life it gave me panic attacks which I still have to this day and which I'm still learning to live with and what I've learned from that is never to be in a place like that again never to be in a place where I don't feel valued never to be in a place where people cannot my worth uh, never to be in a place where people teach me that my worth is not what I think my worth is or think it's less than rather because where I am now people teach me that my worth is so much more than what I perceive it to be and I don't mean like Worth is in capital. I mean, like, my self as a human being, the time I take to eat, to, like, drink some water, to, breathe, to, like, manage my panic attacks, to, you know, be a human being. But, yeah, yeah. that's my peak of my valley. The last question, which I love to end with, it's not really a question. Um, it, it's called Bitch Down. Okay, basically, we all have rants that we love to rant about. You get 30 seconds to rant about anything that you want, anything and anything. However, you have to either start the sentence or end the sentence with bitch don't. Have you thought of something? Have you got something? I'm ready. All right, five, four, three, two, one. Bitch don't!
don't keep thinking that everything exists between a binary and that something has to exist in between two extremes. Things do not exist like that. Things exist at the intersection of a whole 3D, 4D, 5D world. There are so many perspectives that you cannot see, that you cannot even fathom. And even if you could see them all, they are so vast and Bye. polygonical. So bitch, don't. Bitch, just don't. <laughs> Well done, that ends it for you. And thank you so much for doing this. I appreciate it. I hope you had fun. Well, everyone, that brings us to an end, and I hope you enjoyed that. I want to say a massive thank you to the guest for their time. All of the information about the guest, myself, and the show will be listed in the bio. Make sure to follow, share, comment, and subscribe. Show us all some love, because isn't that what we want at the end of the day, some love? Your support really helps the show and the message of it grow and the people that are on here. Thank you again, and as I always say, breathe in, breathe out. Now must go. Which means now I must go. I own that. That is copyrighted and I will sue. <laughs> Joking. Have a great one. And stay curious. Till next time. <laughs>